who have used CocoTB or been a user for a long time, um, let's say, gosh, five years or more maybe? Pretty much five years. Yeah, so there was a time where it existed and it was usable, but there wasn't much of a community around it. And there's a bit of a famous GitHub issue that was titled, is CocoTB dead, yeah. right? And there are all these posts on it going, no, no, it's not true. And, you know, and then there was a little bit of a time where there was a bit of a handover. But essentially, I think for, from, there's been plenty of people who've contributed and worked on it, but Philip really, I think, has brought the community together in recent years and is largely responsible for a lot of the momentum that it's picked up since then. Um, so, yeah, it's really great work, and I'm looking forward to hearing what's going on with Coco TV. So, over to you, Philip. Thank you for a very nice intro, Julius. So, who has not heard of Coco? Well, you definitely have heard of Coco TV because we just had it in the world, two previous slides, but who has not kind of used it or has an idea what it actually is? Just raise your hand. Just one, two, three, four. There's always a couple people who have not seen it. So I always have to have those intro slides in there. Just use it once, please. I want to get rid of those slides. So, CoCodB makes verification fun or fun again. And if you talk to your management, replace the word fun with productive and they will be delighted. So that's the short version. Um, the thing is, to make something fun or productive to use, it's actually hard work to get there. Because like, it's like an amusement park, you know, it looks like all fun and Mickey Mouse is playing around, but behind the scenes, somebody's doing some hard work to make that Mickey Mouse look that nice. So, and that's a part of the thing I'm going to talk about today. But for those of you who have not heard about Kokodby, let's just, um, you probably haven't heard about me either. Um, so just a very quick intro, I'm, I'm working at that company, so the, the one that does the mainframe, so that's IBM. Um, and I am director of the Fossey Foundation. I'm uh, with CocoDB um, as a maintainer there. And previously, I was working at Low Risk in Cambridge. And uh, when I moved to Cambridge, and that's exactly the time that Julius was mentioning, I was in an empty apartment. I didn't have anything apart from a garden chair that I brought inside and uh, internet on my phone and a laptop. And I had a couple of weeks until my family arrived. So what I did is just pick up on old CocoDB pull requests. And that's effectively that time when all the, the old pull requests got merged into CocoDB. And that's like four and a half years ago now. And since then, I moved back to Germany, so um, that's why you also see less of my activity actually on CocoDB and day-to-day -day maintenance. But that's enough. Quick intro on CocoDB. So if you want to write a test in CocoDB, and that's kind of the most trivial thing you can do, um, you write a piece of Python code, and you, in that Python code, CocoDB gives you the ability to actually access your design on the test, the thing you're simulating in a simulator. And what we're doing here in that example, and I said it's, it's as trivial as it gets, um, we have a test that, it's not even a test, it's, it's a thing, it's an actor that creates a clock and it just it sets the clock to one and it awaits a nanosecond and sets the clock to zero. And you already see, kind of the syntax doesn't need further explanation, it's, it's as easy as it gets. And the magic effectively is in that DUT argument up there. This is your design on a test, this is the thing that gives you full access to the full hierarchy white box of your design that you're simulating. And if you know that, you know CoCodB. It's uh, really it's as simple as that. Um, you can then run your test, and then it looks like that. Obviously, you need some, some screen output. Um, and that's also something that is integrated in CocoDB. And I initially didn't see as valuable coming kind of from initially the software world where you have kind of a unit test run. It always gives you kind of a way to say this is a test, and it, it gives you a nice framework that says test passed, failed, things like that. But then you come to hard verification, it says, yeah, yeah, there you go. Now build your own test runner. I'm not going to give you something that shows you a pass fail immediately or a rerun or things like that. So CocoDB included that right from the start, and it's surprisingly valuable um, because, yeah, that's, that's just what it does. And it creates a clock. Fantastic, isn't it? It's just uh, it's great. And because it create, can create that clock, it's the only thing that can create clocks. That's why CocoDB is so successful. Um, but there might be other reasons. Um, and it's it's... Not only me who says could be successful. It's this. Um, let's have a look at that graph, and it's not my chart. It's stolen from a survey that is done, I think, every two years, roughly, uh, by Henry Henry Harry, Harry Foster. There, thank you. Um, to just ask the verification world, how do you do verification? What are your pain points? What are you verifying? What do designs look like? And for the first time ever in that survey, so that was a year ago. Actually, CocoDB showed up, and I mean, it's not as big as UVM, that's, that's a given, 
but it's showing up. And the other thing to notice is there is kind of no other Python-based framework in there. So there's um, UVM, and then we're in the other world. So we're being seen and recognized. And this is not a kind of a survey that goes out to the enthusiast, hobbyist community, or kind of the early adopters. This goes to kind of the, your standard industry players. And that's for ASICs. Same is true for FPGAs. Um, the, it, it looks like it's larger there, isn't it? It's nice charts. But it's actually just uh, the scale is different. Um, so <laughs> it's roughly the same, rough 5% or so. Um, so yeah, CocoDB is being seen. It's all just kind of evidence that we glue together to say actually CocoDB is successful. Um, we do a user survey regularly, I can say. We did it twice now. Um, <laughs> and we ask our users, so what, what do you like about CocoDB? How do you use it? Um, what can we improve? Things like that. We want to get some feedback. Because that's kind of one of the, the challenging things in open source, is you put something out there on the internet, um, and Greg just mentioned that earlier with IBEX. Um, you have no idea who's using it, how they're using it, if they're happy with it, if, they're kind of, if every kind of coffee kitchen despises you for producing that thing that they have to use. You don't know, so you have to ask. And that's what we do with that survey. And apparently, people are reasonably happy about it, at least the ones we asked. Um, <laughs> So why is that? And I mean, the main reason why is that is, is first of all, CocoDB is kind of seamless. But the other thing, people like Python. It's, it's just a very easy, productive to use. Um, and tying that, kind of keeping that ease while doing hardware verification is kind of the main reason why people love CocoDB. So the thing, and the thing that Tomas said earlier, verification is software. Treat it as that. And with CocoDB, you can just write your verification code just like you write software code in a productive language, with the tool support you need, with the editor support you need, all of these things that if you come from a software world, you take for granted, just press autocomplete, and there, there you go. And then you're writing VHDL or Verilog, and say, yeah, it's, oh yeah, you have your unconfigured Emacs that doesn't even have syntax highlighting. That's, that's kind of the, it, it doesn't need to be that bad, but it often is. And that's not how you write software, come on. So with success comes some responsibility and some challenges. And that's, I think, the other part of the, the, the thing I, I need to talk about here. Um, that's how you can deal with success and how we dealt with uh, success. And success in the open source world typically means you have a very, very diverse user base. Kind of the, the more well, technical people get and the less of a corporate IT department they have, the more opinionated they get about their own setup of, of computer setup, whatever that might be. And the more diverse it gets, kind of if you sell commercial EDA software to a big company, they probably have all the same setup they're working. It's probably remote, it's set up by a central IT department, so you sell 10,000 licenses to exactly the same machine. If you have 10,000 users of CocoDB, you are guaranteed to have 10,000 different configurations that are out there. And I mean, then honestly, they're the... the configurations that you see in the open are typically even then better than the ones you see in a corporate IT department because they take like a normal Red Hat installation and then they fit in something in there to make it, it Red Hat 4 compatible or whatever. And then they just remove something and replace something else. So kind of serving that user base actually becomes quite tricky if you want to have a software that you can use and install. You have a fair amount of different Python versions and all of that. So dealing with that is tricky and takes time. So we spent a fair amount of time, like those three and a half last years, roughly, to strengthen our foundations, because like, CocoDB started as a small project, so it worked, and it worked well for a fair amount of people, but now it needs to work for a very diverse, diver, a diverse set of people. So one thing we did, and it's kind of, it looks kind of... Now it's super simple. If you want to install CocoDB, you do it just like any other Python package. You type pip install CocoDB, and you're done. Before that, it was clone a Git repository, and then it did a compile a fair amount of, kind of well, a couple C++ uh, files on demand. You say, easy. I mean, just install your GCC and you're done. Can't be that hard. And, that's, and it worked beautifully well. But then it turns out like people use like this, this Windows thingy, for example, <laughs> and they, the app to get GCC doesn't work there. Um, and then you have kind of weird, so we only had like back then GCC2 available, and things, things like that. So you don't want users to compile anything. So we went over to uh, compile it installation time. And now users don't have to compile actually 
the CocoDB libraries at all anymore. That means we have to do it. And we have to do it means that that diverse user base is still there. So now we compile 250 different binaries, that's Python wheels, for then kind of to be one particular one to be used. That's one per simulator and one per Python plus glibc configuration to answer your question that was coming up there. <laughs> Yes, that's many links. That's many links. That's Windows um, and uh, Mac, and then obviously Mac diversified again. So you have uh, that. So it's, it never ends, you know. Um, so yeah, that's kind of one thing. Took took a while to get right, but I think it's it's beautifully right now and it works. Um, the other thing is, CocoDB does have its internal test suite. That's actually quite comprehensive, but running that test suite is something that was done manually because it runs against all the simulators that CocoDB supports. And CocoDB supports effectively all proprietary simulators out there plus the open source ones. So actually when you want to do a release, you say, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm done with a bit of coding, let's just do a release. Now instead of just pressing a button and there your release is out, you have to email a couple of people, oh, I heard you have a cadence license, can you run that test suite for me? And you over there have a synopsis license, can you run that test suite for me? And they get back a couple of weeks later and just, it drags out. So um, CI is the solution, easy. But now we're an open source project. Now you approach Cadence or Siemens or LDEC. I want this uh, simulator license to run in an open source public CI. Are you giving me that? And they initially said no, which is quite understandable. But the thing is, things have changed. So. Thanks to the success of CocoDB, we now actually run um, Excelium, we run Questa, and we run Riviera Pro in CI. So every pull request that you do on a CocoDB, on the open CocoDB repository, gets run against those simulators to make sure kind of every change in CocoDB stays valid. And that is just increasing the quality and uh, decreasing the maintenance effort um, of CocoDB dramatically. And I mean, it, it sounds all nice and simple, but just kind of getting one of those licenses takes at least a year in contract negotiations. You have your lawyer involved in all of these things. So um, you're getting there at some point, but it, in the end, it's just hard work to get there. The other thing is we deleted a fair amount of things. And that's kind of, in, in, in hindsight, something for everybody to be very aware of. Um, CocoDB was written in a way that kind of, you, you, it's, it's Python, so effectively there is no tends to be no strict separation between a public API and a private API, so you can do whatever you want. Um, but some things were clearly not intended to be public API, but it weren't clearly marked as such, so somebody was using them, and then you figure out, actually, that, that implementation detail needs to change, I just need to say, change something, and then you step on somebody's toe who says, I, I can't update because you just took away my API, and you say, oh, that was never intended to be an API. That's it. Yeah, but it was. Um, so, going then through a process that kind of deprecates many of these things and then further on kind of re de uh, removes them at some point in time, takes a fair amount of time. And again, that's not a kind of beautiful work in some kinds because you're always trying to be very, very careful, very, very deliberate. So you need to move very slowly. Um, so we are, have been through that process for a couple of iterations, so we um, Try to be as user-friendly as possible. Obviously, we don't just delete stuff, so that you get a deprecation warning. It tells you, please, don't use that anymore. If you do a further update, it might uh, break your test benches, so to allow you to iteratively kind of keep pace. So if you're doing something new, be very, very kind of restrictive with your public API. So what's happening going forward? Um, there are a couple breaking changes that are coming that are kind of, uh, as at so we're at a point where we did most deprecations, where we warned people about stuff that they shouldn't be using, um, but there's still some things we can't fix without kind of changing the, the, kind of requiring users to change the test benches that are running. And we're trying to be the, as, kind of as limited as possible, but there's some changes that need to happen. And one of them is that looks like very, very innocent, that diff, is um, whenever you access a signal, you use the dot value syntax for your DOT, so that's effectively every signal access you do. And we're changing the return type of that from being a binary value to being a logic array. That's just naming, obviously, but there's much more behind that. So the, the design of the binary value class is not ideal in 2023, let's put it like that. And um, there's some things that just can't be changed without kind of 
being more explicit about, for example, signed conversions or things like that. It, for example, implicitly um, assumes that your signal uh, is signed and does operations based on that, which is typically not true. It's just bits um, or anything. Um, so things like that. And these will require changes to your test bench. So that's something that's coming. Um, we're also thinking about making more type information available to the user. So right now, when you access a signal in CocoDB, um, CocoDB doesn't know if that, well, it knows if it's an array, for example, and it knows kind of the, the dimensions, um, but it doesn't know if you kind of um, had a, a struct, what kind, of, what kind of type struct or whatever that behind that. Well, it knows at runtime, but um, it would be nice if, you, for example, your, your editor could autocomplete based on um, knowing that this is an array that you access and not just the uh, same number. Um, there are some challenges to that, but it's, it's clearly possible. And um, that's, yeah, more thoughts on that uh, later on. We did work on, for example, deprecating the fork and changing how coroutines slightly work. There are still a fair amount of edge cases in error propagation um, that are being sorted. Um, one thing that people often hate is um, how to run your simulation. So typically, if you still get started with CoCoDB, you start with a make file like that. It's, it's trivial. Um, and that works beautifully. Um, if you do kind of the, the quick start, you get a small simulation running. And then we mainly did that make-based framework to actually run our own regression, because we kind of run CoCoDB against models, and we want them to see what happens. So that's kind of also a very defined set of features that you need. But once people start using those mic files to run kind of arbitrary designs with CoCoDB, it just explodes. So you kind of, what started as a simple make file thingy, oh, I need this feature. I need to pass the simulator this and that and that. And the thing is, you don't even need to use that. You only need to pass your simulator kind of the, the VPI library. But that's inconvenient. Um, so there are a couple options. Um, and one that we're currently looking into is kind of the Python-based test runner. It's effectively replacing those make files with a bit of Python code, and especially the ability to do extensions to that, to kind of get around the where do we end the feature set kind of creep. Um, thing is, we can't do it alone. So there are many ideas in there. Many of them have been kind of lingering around. And I'm pretty sure in all of you's head, there are more ideas. So there is the CoCoDB on conference tomorrow uh, from, from 9 to, to 1 PM. Um, at the same location where we had the, the social event yesterday. Come along. It's an unconference, so you, if you have something to talk about, if there's an idea in your head, if there's a complaint, if you want to just really annoy a CoCoDB maintainer, just come there, shout, and then maybe we can at some point turn that into a constructive discussion. So, yeah, please bring your own discussion topics. That's for tomorrow. Just to conclude here, CoCoDB is productive and it's fun. Um, Say, if, if you have ideas, come tomorrow. And finally, appreciate the work that the maintainers put in there. And that's not on me. That's especially also on, on Caleb up there and Tomas up there, who actually did the main work. I'm just the outreach guy. I'm, the most thing I do for CoCoDB is presentations. Um, so if you want to say thank you, say thank you to Caleb and say thank you to Tomas. Thank you all. Nice work, Philip. Uh, yeah, questions? Thank you for your presentation and work on CoCoTB. But uh, how would you compare it to VUnit? And they apparently do have the test runners from Python and so on. I actually have never used VRunner much, so I'm, I'm really a bad person to ask that question. Maybe somebody in the room has it better understanding yeah so uh, it has the same kind of test runner but the unit you'd run you describe your test benches in VHDL in CocoDB you describe it in Python so that's basically the difference I would say I think there was some so thing going on and some stumbling blocks where kind of the fundamental models didn't fully match but I Completely blank on the details. I'm, I'm, there, there is some discussion out there. I'm or you can use FuseOp, which has both VUnit <laughs> and uh, CoCoDB backends. 
Okay. Um, maybe, do we want one more question? I was just saying, maybe you should come along to the unconference tomorrow and Unless, yeah, yeah. hassle okay all the you? developers and facilitators. But one more, one more, maybe. Was that? Who had the question? Oh, sorry. Who was first? I think Leon was first. <laughs> All right, we'll do two. Quick. Uh, my question is, is there, it's, it's a bit of a side question, is there already support in open source simulators to do mixed language support, maybe by integrating two simulators at the same time or any other way? I don't think so. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's, I don't think there is any open source simulator that can do mixed language. Um, on the question, can you do two simulators at the same time? At the moment, you can't. I mean, there's nothing kind of fundamentally preventing there from, from the Python side. But on the kind of the backend side, it's, it's VPI or VHPI. VPI is kind of a single simulator and then a process. So kind of extending that to multiple is I'm pretty sure possible, but it's not as easy. And I don't think it has been done. The comment is that you would have to have the schedulers sync up between the two simulators. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, so I was wondering whether you're also considering the VPI support for emulation platforms. I mean, CocoDB on its side, it's, it's just interfacing with whatever has VPI support. So um, if your emulation platform has VPI support, you're, you're done there. Um, but then, I don't know, um, what you're using, uh, is there a kind of an emulation platform that you think about? Uh, I'm kind of thinking about Synopsys emulation platform, which basically is using then the VCS VPI, but has some, let's call it peculiarities of emulation. <laughs> I reckon it might come down to the scheduler there again, right? Like if you can control the time steps and whatever, just like CocoTB does internally, kind of don't see why not. But I'm not familiar with... Yeah, yeah in theory, it shouldn't be a problem. All right, we should... If there's so much uh, interesting chat around CocoTB, that... Two simulator things, a big brain idea. I like that. That's cool. Um, but come tomorrow morning and hang out and talk all things Coco TB. Uh, yes. At the unconference. See you there. And yeah. if you come, just please, uh, there, there's a sign out, uh, kind of a poster out there just to mark that you're coming mm. so that we can find the right sized room. Thank cool. you. Thanks again, Philip. Cheers. <laughs>